Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I get his minute and 30 seconds? <laughs> oh, and just by way of opening, I'll say that I, I, I'm basing a lot of these questions on testimony that we've heard in the uh, Standing Committee on Fisheries and Oceans. It's an excellent committee with a lot of nonpartisan cooperation between members around the table. Uh, but I won't cite every witness to every specific question. I'm following up on an earlier question around the climate impacts of extreme weather events and those impacts on fish habitat. We know we have impacts on and threats to Pacific salmon from flooding, from wildfires, from the destruction of riparian zones that used to shield the waters to keep them from getting too hot, from increased water temperatures. But I want to focus on what we're going to do to rebuild infrastructure after the November floods in BC. We could do it wrong and worsen salmon habitat through building dikes and dredging. We could do it right, and some of the expert witnesses suggested that Washington State was where we ought to look for excellence in their flood plains by design program, which actually works to reduce flood risks while enhancing and restoring salmon habitat. Can the minister update us on whether DFO is actively pursuing flood plains by design? The Honourable Minister. Uh, well, thank you so much for that question, um, and uh, that I shared that concern absolutely, that it's not just the effects of the flooding and slides and fires, it's actually how we rebuild from them. And so I was mentioning earlier that I've been part of the emergency um, Committee of Provincial and Federal Ministers, and each time my and BFO's <clears throat> interventions has been to make sure the other ministers understand the importance of having fish-friendly rebuilding. So we are going to continue to press that point. Our government provided $5 billion to the province to help rebuild from the flooding in November, and that, that rebuilding has to be done in a way that is fish-friendly. Uh, so I'm going to be asking for a report on what we're doing to ensure that, and I thank the member for her concern. The Honourable Member for Central Coast Islands. Moving to the problem of what people call aquaculture, but my constituents insist I call toxic fish factories, how we're going to get them out of the water as the Minister's government promised. Uh, some of the witnesses who testified recently on the science issue felt that going to the question of why your department, not the Minister personally, obviously, but the department, has in certain sections suppressed science, suppressed science on viruses, suppressed science on sea lice. And the conclusion was it had to do with the fact that the Fisheries Act structurally has a conflict of interest of both promoting that the aquaculture industry and regulating it. Would the minister be open in looking at the new Aquaculture Act to eliminating that conflict of interest, have a different department promote aquaculture, and have DFO protect wild fish stocks? Excellent. The Honourable Minister. Well, thank you uh, for that question. Uh, thank you to the uh, speaker through you, um, to the member. So uh, we do have a process, the, the uh, CSAS process, uh, which uh, provides the opportunity for peer review of science. And I understand what the member is saying, that there has been some recent research that's come out since the CSAS report that uh, uh, determined minimal risk, and at a certain point when there is a, a, a body of work that hasn't been reviewed, I'm, I will be requesting that another peer review process takes place uh, through CESA so we can update our, uh, our analysis of the, the risk to wild salmon. The Honourable Member. Moving on, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, I was really pleased to hear the minister say that uh, she recognizes that polystyrene is a real problem of plastic pollution in our coastal areas. But I'm disappointed to hear that what it sounded like is that DFO is interested in getting it out of the ocean. Is DFO working with Environment Canada and Climate Change to improve the regulations currently under review for ocean plastics to put polystyrene's use in the marine and coastal areas on a list so we avoid it getting into the ocean in the first place? The Honourable Minister. The, uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this. Uh, uh, the, this um, analysis and, and development of regulations is being done by uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. It's not a partnership uh, with DFO, but uh, I, I, I take the, the member's point that it's very important that polystyrene be 
uh, regulated so that is it's not in the ocean in the same in the same um, volume that's been there because it's very deleterious to uh, to fish. Honourable member. Moving on to southern resident Killer Wells. Um, by the way, one of my constituents, whom the minister will also know, the Honourable Pat Carney, has said for many years that we don't have an ocean protection plan. We have an ocean protection wish list. I would like to see an ocean protection plan and not just a pile of money and a list of things to do. But in the relation to southern resident Killer Wells, in my riding, the interim sanctuary zones around Pender and Saturna have been there since 2019. Nobody's ever been charged. Nobody's ever been ticketed. There have been numerous violations. And the question, and the local volunteers and whale sighting groups have now established that whales are present year round. Yet this seasonal so called sanctuary zone is only operating June 1st to November 30th. Is the minister willing to look at the new science and recognize whales are present year round? The Honorable Minister. Uh, well, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I am always willing to look at new science. I am always willing to adjust our measures to reflect what we've learned, and the southern resident uh, ki killer whales are a, a, a key um, a key species for us to protect. So there is a review every year, and uh, we'll take a look at the, at the enforcement concerns that the member is raising. The Honourable Member, about 60 seconds or so. Given the threat of ocean acidification due to the increased carbon atmospheric carbon creating carbonic acid and threatening life in the oceans, is DFO currently measuring pH levels on all our coastlines to keep track of ocean acidification? Well, thank you for that question uh, to, to, uh, through the speaker and uh, the, the, the impacts. Uh, I've seen the science around acidification, but also deoxygenation as well as warming. So we've got a, a triple whammy. And um, it's one of the reasons that it's so important that we now consider climate change. We think about climate change as we do our uh, marine protected area planning because the resilience of a healthy um, a, 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 the healthy seabed floor is important for the resilience of the whole uh, ecology and we need to build that resilience as we face this uh, these changes under climate change and we do monitor pH levels of all of our oceans.